The idea of this session today is um, uh, to explore the question, uh, do scaled agile frameworks work? And uh, look at what the theory says, what are the empirical evidence, what do they show, and what expert thinks. Um, I will also have my own uh, opinion on that. For each of these points, I will also provide uh, a few links to the full account of the answer to those questions, including reference to the original sources, because we will try to go fast to have a quick overview on those things. But those of you that want to look deeper, I provide relevant links. And I will finish with some hints uh, on uh, alternative uh, to scaled framework. So a little introduction about uh, myself. I'm Luca Minudel, and I work with a few large organizations that uh, adopted Agile at scale. But today, I would like to mention uh, two of these experiences. Uh, one was with the Ferrari, is a place where they have to have agility, not by choice, but by necessity, and where agility is needed uh, in the whole organization beyond the IT. So, for example, in the design of the car, in the development of the car manufacturing, or race control at the pit wall. The other company, the other experience uh, that uh, is relevant and I would like to mention in terms of uh, agility at scale is ThoughtWorks. Last time I checked, they had 42 offices in 50 different countries and uh, uh, the old company is run following lean and agile principles. So this is kind of my experience in the area. I would like to start uh, uh, from uh, what the theory say about uh, scaling agile frameworks. And uh, specifically, I would like uh, to mention the theory of simplicity. There are many other theories, but that's, uh, I think it's a good starting point. And uh, the first bit uh, is uh, John Gall uh, principles. John Gall principle says that the complex system that work uh, is found of, uh, having evolved from a simple system uh, that work. And you cannot try to design from scratch a complex system because it will never work. And you cannot even try to patch it after to make it work. You have always to start small and making work first. This idea of a small and iterative increment refinement permeates uh, the all agile and agile at its core. You can look, for example, at the, the 10 principles from the Agile Manifesto. The principles say simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work uh, uh, not done is essential. You can find uh, uh, the influence of John Gall principles also in the idea of simple design and in the software development practices in extreme programming. But not only in the code base, only when we look at the, uh, the scope and user stories, uh, this principle influenced the, the idea of prioritization, min minimum viable product, and the Pareto principles where 20% uh, of the user stories uh, bring 80% of the business uh, uh, value. When we use the adjective lightweight to name agile, principle, agile framework, this is also a place where uh, simplicity has influenced uh, agile. And uh, also how, agile, how teams and organizations adopt agile framework and way of working. One less obvious, uh, one less obvious uh, consequences of these principles uh, is that you cannot have a recipe book that tell you upfront what to do to adopt Agile or to scale. And when you are adopting or scaling Agile, you cannot design or tailor upfront your scaling initiative. You cannot have a target operating model or you cannot define upfront a predefined set of practices because the path and the journey of scaling your organization unfold and reveal itself as you go and it is in constant evolution and change. So 
there is uh, another element, uh, another element uh, that I would like to share with you, and this is the definition of maneuver agility. Uh, maneuver agility, it is a, a prerequisite uh, to agility, and it is an ability that those on the ground uh, doing the work uh, should have. So team members, for example. Maneuver agility is to recognize uh, which approach uh, is best for the circumstances that a team or an organization is facing and the ability to quickly shift to that approach. So when we look at the original agile framework such as uh, Scrum, Extreme Programming, Kanban, uh, uh, Clistar, Career and so on, they are all simple and partially incomplete. They are underspecified because they leave room for maneuver and they challenge the team members and those doing the work to iteratively and incrementally experiment, learn, adapt and evolve their way of working to fit their own circumstances. So those agile framework are intentionally incomplete. And since they have to learn how to adapt from the beginning, then they achieve this maneuver of agility that they will enable them to adapt when the, the circumstances of the uh, team or of, or of the organization changes. Again, another less obvious consequence of this is that we cannot separate those doing the work, uh, sorry, those doing the adoption on the scale and or the scaling from those doing the work. People on the ground, team members doing the work should be involved as key actor in an agile adoption or in a scaling initiative. This is one of the consequences of maneuver agility. So because agile frameworks are uh, intentionally incomplete, uh, uh, we need something more. And this is where the agile community come in help. The Agile community is constantly innovating and evolving new ideas and is giving us a knowledge base of practices and a set of patterns that practitioners and team members can use in order to find inspiration and uh, to find ideas to evolve their way of working in order to fit their own circumstances. For these reasons, uh, people in the team uh, doing the work should have a direct access uh, without limitation, intermediation and filters to the Agile community. Last bit uh, of uh, the theory, well, uh, this is more a quote from uh, Ron Jeffrey that is one of the co-authors of Extreme Programming. And uh, uh, Ron Jeffrey quoted Chad Hendrickson, uh, that is one that helped develop extreme programming. And they say simplicity is the essence of what makes up agility. So since agile is simple, a scaled version of agile should also be simple or even simpler. Now, I would like for you to take a moment uh, and to think about uh, the scaled framework uh, that you have in mind. Uh, the one that you use or the one that you like, and think how much of those frameworks are aligned with the, all this theory of simplicity. Here we are. Okay, so go ahead. The second yes, part go ahead. is about, uh, um, now let's have, it's about uh, empirical evidence, and let's see what empirical evidence show. And in order to do that, uh, uh, I'm going to look uh, at uh, uh, I'm going to look uh, at uh, eight case studies uh, of a few companies that you see listed uh, on the left side uh, of the screen. So those companies have succeeded in achieving agility at scale. Uh, what does it mean, uh, agility here? So here with agility, what I mean is that these companies are fast, dynamic, innovative, flexible, adaptive, and resilient. And what does it mean, sir? Uh, what is the definition of success? Yeah, uh, success means uh, 
achieving tangible and lasting benefit for the business, being successful in, in the sense that they are the leader of their market and their products are uh, successful. So let's have a look at uh, how they achieved the agility at scale. So 50% of these companies, four of them had agility since the beginning and they continue to have that agility when they grow later on. Instead, four of them at some point had to change the, their way of working in order to achieve that agility or to regain a level of agility that they had lost. What is the driver for that agility? We see that the large majority of uh, companies, the five of them, uh, had a bottom-up and a top-down drive at the same time in order to achieve uh, uh, that agility. Some of those companies started to develop agility at team level with the bottom-up drive in order to introduce the key concept and the building blocks. And then the top-down top drive joined the bottom-up together. One company, instead uh, Amazon, had primarily a top-down drive. Many of you may remember the two pizza team thing that happened in Amazon. For other two companies, we know that they had a top-down drive toward agility, but we do not have any information that say if there was or there wasn't a bottom-up drive. So that is the question mark in the middle. Now, what these companies have in common in their pursuit of agility? Uh, let's have a look. All of those companies grew their own way of working internally, and they are still growing and evolving their way of working now. All of those companies take explicit inspiration or implicit inspiration from the Lean and Agile principle and mindset. So or they explicitly uh, look at the, the principles or their way of working is congruent with those principles. With two small exceptions, Amazon is known for having a demanding and aggressive company culture. And this is not uh, aligned with the principle of sustainable pace and with psychological safety. The other company is Netflix. In their company culture, they keep only the best. And so they have a keeper test that uh, goes against the psychological safety. So those are the two exceptions. When we talk about the teams, all of those companies use the, as a core component for their way of working, uh, the concept of teams. The agile, what we know are the agile teams, so cross-functional long-standing teams that build and run their own product. And uh, there is a strong focus on autonomy as well as on the responsibility of those teams. Another thing that I noticed looking uh, uh, at all the case study of this company is that uh, they all have an extremely strong focus on technical excellence. And uh, they also have uh, technical practices at scale that are inspired and rooted in extreme programming. So think, for example, uh, test automation, continuous integration, trunk-based development, continuous delivery and DevOps at scale. Another thing in common between these companies is, and in their pursuit of agility is that none of these companies, uh, when they scale it, uh, when they pursue their agility at scale, none of these companies used any scaled agile framework or took any inspiration by any agile, any agile uh, sorry, scaled agile framework, none of them. None of them scale it with the copy and past or imitation approach. What does it mean? For example, copying the Spotify no model or copy what some scaled framework uh, tell you to do. None of them did that. And none of them use a cookie cutter approach from the team's way of working. 
what is a cookie cutter approach? Is that you decide uh, one team, how that team should work, and then all the other teams should work exactly in the same way, same, pra same practices, same processes, same tools. None of them did that. Indeed, all the teams had a lot of autonomy to decide many things, not everything, but many things. And none of these eight companies are there to just one single agile framework, the, the basic one, the original one, or by the book. Instead, all of them implicitly or explicitly took practices and idea from many frameworks based on what was uh, working well for them. The next question is, how many of these companies define themselves uh, agile? Well, only three out of eight companies say we are agile. The other do not mention agile. They just think about doing what works well for them. And among those three companies, none of them think about scaling agile. The idea of scaling agile or scaled framework is not the concept uh, that is used in any of those uh, companies. Now let's look at companies that uh, took uh, different directions. Company that went heavyweight. Company that went heavyweight adopting a scaled framework or went heavyweight adopting an uh, uh, off-the-shelf platform in order to replace some of the strategic component of their platform. So let's see how this company did. I mentioned two of these companies adopted an heavyweight scaled agile framework. The other two companies adopted an heavyweight platform with the usual promise. It will be an easy configuration. There will be only very few personalization. The migration of the data will be easy. And then it will be very easy to adapt this off the shelf platform to the changing need of your client. How did it work? How many of these companies had the positive business impact? Well, from the case studies and from the pub information publicly available, we can say that uh, none of these companies had the positive and lasting impact for their business. Uh, the two companies that adopted the heavyweight platform, they had very negative consequences preventing them to achieve their business goal. And also the company value on the market was negatively affected. Talking about the company that uh, adopted heavy, heavyweight scaled framework, uh, one of those company after releasing four products developed using the uh, scaled framework uh, had a sharp fall in the stock price, 65% uh, down. That's uh, how the stock price went and never recover. The company growth was stopped and business an analysts mentioned that they noticed the lack of innovation. The other company finished recently, so it is too early to say if there are tangible uh, positive effects uh, to, the to their business and if they are lasting. It is a little too early. Let's see what else do they have in common, these companies? Well, uh, those companies adopting heavyweight framework and also those going heavyweight uh, uh, from a technological point of view, uh, they did not have any bit of lean and agile uh, mindset. When you read the documentation of the case studies, you notice quite the opposite, that the traditional mindset seems to become even stronger. None of these companies also had any focus on technical excellence. The one that adopted uh, an off-the-shelf platform, of course, went in the opposite direction of technical excellence, especially when you do that for a strategic component of your own platform, a component that is strategic for your business. And not even the other that adopted an heavyweight scaled framework had the focus on technical excellence. And this is a problem because technical excellence uh, give us technical agility. And when you want to achieve organizational agility and business agility, then technical agility is a prerequisite. So that's a problem. That was a problem for them. And none of those companies show any strong focus on the autonomy of the team. Quite the opposite, the team delegated a lot of autonomy to new layers of management. Now, it's important to say that uh, correlation does not imply causation. 
both for the lesson that you learned from the company that succeeded and both from the lesson that you learned from the, these companies that uh, did not succeed in achieving agility at scale. What we can do is to use this lesson to inspire the experiment that you can do in your own organization in order to see what works or what do not work uh, in your specific circumstances. Now let's have a look at, at what experts think. We will look specifically to comments and critique to SAFE, but so far the theory that we have discussed, as well as the case studies and some of the comments of these experts have a general validity that goes beyond one specific scaled framework. Some, while some critique is very specific to SAFE. So let's look at consultants that have a safer certification, including some of the trainer. And there is a growing number of a safe consultant that they want to distantiate themselves from safe and or they want to stop working with clients that are attracted by safe. One of the reasons is that because they do not recognize agile and safe anymore. So this is some of the comment uh, from a former certified uh, safe uh, consultant. Al Shalwe particularly uh, worked for a com is working for a company that is his own company that was gold uh, certified with the safe. But is not uh, those are not the only one that have a negative uh, opinion about SAFE. We find a lead, leading expert in leadership and management, uh, Steve Dane, Danning and uh, uh, Dave Snowden, uh, but also Barry Boehm, you find him in your book of software engineering, as, as well as US Air Force, express a very negative opinion on SAFE. But we can say the same for, uh, from Lean and Agile experts, such for example, Mary Popeldick, Chris Matz, ThoughtWorks in general, and many other. The overall opinion on, on SAFE is not uh, that positive. And we can say that also for many of the co-author of the Agile Manifesto. They did not express an opinion collectively, but they did express uh, their opinion individually and publicly. And uh, their uh, set of opinions goes from extremely negative opinions to more middle opinion, but still negative. A couple of them told that they would want to see a few more companies that have adopted SAFE in order to form their opinion. But what you cannot find is one single leading expert advising to use SAFE. The one that had publicly expressed their opinion, they advise against using SAFE. Some of the reasons are that the scaled framework safe is too heavyweight, is top-down, is oriented to traditional top-down management, goes against agile mindset, and some critique is specific to some specific practices. For example, uh, that they are poorly, poorly integrated or that just they are second best or third best practices.